Welcome back to the podcast. Beloved, this is indeed your brother, Big VJ, checking in. Today's conversation, we're going to talk about nutrition and farming and food, family. But ultimately, though, right? Ultimately, we're going to have a conversation about how much do you trust the so-called white man? We ultimately going to have a conversation about that. You know what I mean? So, yep. Um, we got an article poured up. We're going to read something from the Americano. Not much. Maybe like two or three paragraphs. And we're going to put a question on the table. And we're going to see how much you love this trickster. You know what I mean? How much you love this caveman. And we're going to see how much you really trust this caveman, right? Because, you know, you let our people tell it. You know, we're a little religious. And we got this canned response. You know what I mean? I don't trust in man. (laughs) Right? How many of you heard that? I don't trust in man, beloved. I trust in God. I don't believe in man, beloved. I believe in God. I don't. And we talk it now, right? We talk it. We talk it. Do we walk it? It's interesting, though. When somebody tells you that they don't believe in man, they believe in God, their proof of that statement is handing you a book that was written by a man with a God in it, right? But maybe, maybe, just maybe, that is a different story for a different day. The headline reads in bold red print. It says the 12 companies that own 80% of what you buy. And then you scroll down just a little bit. And then it says when you walk into a grocery store, you see a lot of products. But the companies that provide these options are actually quite few. Let's stop. Let's stop. Let's stop. 12 companies. Just 12 own a lot of the products in the grocery stores that you and I go to. Wow, wow, blood. what does that mean? How much do we trust the so-called white man, the devil himself, we're making sure that all 60 million of us as black Americans are going to have something to eat. How much do we trust? How much do we trust? How much do we trust them? Because, you know, in my estimate, beloved, I see it this way, right? You know, we're going to have to go back to a time that our foremothers lived in and our forefathers lived in. And that was a time where they kept the family together and they had a farm. Right? This is just my estimate, right? This is the way I see it, right? So much so, like, check this out, right? Check this out. You know, my big mama used to put something on the table and it stuck with me. She had a saying, man. She had a saying, sisters. It, it stuck with me now. Never put your belly in another man's hand. <laughs> listen, beloved. These, listen. These elders and ancestors of ours had some sayings. I'm talking about some sayings, some quotes, some parables that had so much power in them. They were few words, though. But they had so much power in them. Never put your belly in another man's hands. The grass ain't greener on the other side. So many sayings they said down there, right? What was mama telling us? As a family. As a tribe. When she said that. You got a better chance and trusted in yourself to making sure that you got something to eat than trusting in somebody else. Which means, beloved, that we have to have a relationship, right? A relationship with the sun, with the soil, with the seed, with the water, right? So on this podcast, we say that, you know, the original man black man he must have the knowledge of how to plant two seeds 
he must know we must know how to plant the seed in the woman and the seed in the ground and we have to be there for both all springs right we can't be running around and absent and not on the spot we got to be present right you know my big mama that made that statement right I was real inquisitive. I used to ask my mom, like, cause I'm like, you know, I'm looking at how many aunties and uncles I got. And it's a bunch, it's a whole heap of them, as they say down south, right? <laughs> it's it. You know, mama had a whole heap of chilling. So I said, say, I said, man, you know, how did big mama feed all of y'all? It's a whole bunch of y'all. You know what I'm saying? How did she it's a, so my mama say, well, she said, baby, when uh when mama was young, mama had her own chicken coop in the back. She had her own miniature farm back there. She had a she grow her peas and her collard greens and turnip greens, and she can go in the backyard and she made her own. You know, she had the chickens. They produced their own eggs. She knew how to ring the chicken neck. You ring that chicken neck. You let him run around the backyard for a little while with his neck broke. You get him. You cut that neck off. You drain that blood. You know what I'm saying? And you know you got you some good grease. <laughs> Did you hear me, beloved? You got some good grease. And you got you some supper. Right? You got supper out of that. And this is the this was the plate. And I learned it wasn't until my big mama got older when she began to get more and more and more things from the grocery store, from the supermarket. But when our mothers was young, it was not like so. It was not like so. They had farms, livestock, they had what they needed in the backyard. And they would go to the supermarket for the odds and ends. See, they they walked it like they talked. They didn't put their belly in another man's hands. Because coming up in these times, this devil can close this grocery store whenever he chooses. It's his store. He can close this store whenever he get ready. He can close these stores whenever he feels like it, right? Let's take a look at the article real quick, right? I'm going to put the link up in the description, Bob. Let's just take a look at the article. We're going to have a conversation. We're going to build a little bit. All is the mind. And the universe is mental, right? Because food is so integrated in our everyday and our mental, physical, and gut health, we find it important to know who makes what you consume and even what they value. After all, what you eat every day has long-term health outcomes. About 80% of the groceries you buy are owned by 12 companies. I'm repeat that again. About 80% of the groceries you buy are owned by these 12 companies. PepsiCo, Nestle, Kellogg's, Unilever, Coca-Cola, Procter & Gamble, Mars, Danone, General Mills, Kraft, Mondelez, and poor man all right beloved let's stop let's stop let's stop these large food industries organizations large food industry organizations so no matter where we go on a retail level myers walmart uh kroger's what else we got costco's if you're a little fancy, you're doing well in life, you may go to the Super Target for grocery shopping, right? You hang out with the Frenchies. These retail giants get their groceries from the Big 12. So my question to the village is this. If these retailers close their doors, they lock their doors, what are you going to eat? What are you going to eat? You are one war away, or you are one pandemic. I mean, pardon me. You're one pandemic away from these people locking their doors. So if they lock their doors, what are you going to eat, beloved? What you going to eat? What you going to eat? I'm asking this is a serious question. How are your family going to eat if they lock their doors? What are you going to eat? Um... You know, there's something that we always say here. We say, you know what? The, the lucky thing about being a black American, the lucky thing 
about living in the hells of North America and the territory that we call the United States is we don't have to be smart. Nobody is asking us to be smart. All we have to do is listen to the words of our ancestors who are no longer here, but they did the work and they left the writings behind and listen to our elders that are currently here and we will be fine. We won't have no problems. Things will be easy peasy. It'll be very smooth for us if we just do those two things, right? We had a brother back in the day, peace be upon him, he's no longer here. His name was Noble Drew Ali. And our brother, Noble Drew Ali, by those that affectionately loved him, was called the prophet. You know what I mean? And there's some prophecies that he made, but there's one that really sticks out to me. Right? There's one that sticks out to me. I remember he was telling the brothers back in the day, he said, you know, it's going to come a time. He talked to the Moorish brothers, right? He said, it's going to come a time where you as Moors are going to have to beat off European women with sticks. Man, because they're going to be running you down. Now, they used to think the brother was tripping because this is the 1920s. They're like, come on, come on, brother. I mean... They're hanging out people from trees from dealing with these cave women and these misties, these Beckys, and all. Come on, man. It's not, it's, that's not, but they just went along. But just to see, a hundred years later, on a neighborhood level, on a career level, on an entertainment level, that's true. Our brothers had to beat these cave women off them because they come right up to them to approach them. But just, just thinking though, for, for a brother to say that in the 1920s, he's seen something. That was so far-fetched, but he's seen something. But, beloved, that ain't the only thing he's seen, right? Our brother, Noble Draw Lee, peace be upon him, he's no longer here. He was talking to the Moors brothers, right? He was talking to the Moors. And he says to the brother, and he said, you know, and I quote, he said, one day you're going to go to the store, and there will be soldiers there with guns and bayonets on them, and they won't let you in there. They will order you to move on. That's a quote and unquote. What did our brother see? Because we know that America, it's, it's not like this is a land of famine. This land have always produced. This soil has always produced, right? So what did he see in our open enemy that one day he would put us in a position? Because he will often talk about, you need to have a warehouse, with so many days of food that you could hold yourself over. He talked to our people, right? The Moorish community, the so-called black man of America. What did he see, though? There's a brother, right? There's a brother named Cook Bay from Illinois. And there's another quote that he got from my brother, Noble Drew Ali. And that is this. He says, one day the Europeans are going to lock up the food in the warehouses. They're going to put soldiers around to guard them. And you will go anywhere he says to go to get something to eat. That's a quote and unquote. What did he see? What did he see? Or better yet, what are you going to do if the so-called white man lock up these... What are you going to eat? Now... This is why sometimes on this platform, we have a lot of issues with religious niggas. Because it's this thing with these black Muslims, many of them, the, the Orthodox, right? It's primarily the Orthodox black Muslims. And these Christians and these Jehovah Witnesses and all this old Mormonism kind of deal. And it's so, because it's this whole mystery guy thing that's going to say, well, if your open enemy close. The grocery store down and the supermarkets down the food gonna come out of the sky it's gonna do something gonna miraculously happen out of the sky where you have something to eat but we know that's not so like that it doesn't work that way you have to have your own relationship sun soil water and seed right so when big mama right at the biblical text when she used to say well you reap what you sow that is more real than just car just put it in that little compartment where we're talking about your actions. You can only reap what you sow. If we are living 
60 million of us in America are living every day. We have no relationship with seeds. We don't know where to get seeds from. We're not putting anything in the ground. This means we have to live off those that have the knowledge of seed time and harvest because we don't have it. We don't have the knowledge. We're going to heaven. You know how I many niggas on their way to heaven? But when they come here, we don't, we ain't with that spooky stuff. When you get over here, we say, man, you know, the heavens ain't never gave you nothing, brother. You a gas being, brother. You a human. You a gas being. You just, you're no different than that car outside, right? <laughs> so listen, it all, it's all, it's all about the mind over here, brother. Man is the mind. And the mind is the all in all. Man is not the body. Nor the soul. The man is the mind. This body that we're wearing, beloved, this is just a suit. It is just a temple. It is a vehicle that we use to move around in this physical plane. That, that's all it is, right? So just like your car outside or your motorcycle or whatever you got, just like it takes gas, beloved, you take gas to move around. Your gas is oxygen. You breathe in oxygen. You are a gas being. You breathe in oxygen. You breathe out carbon dioxide. The plants and the grass and the trees, they breathe in the carbon dioxide that you breathe out. And then they breathe out the oxygen that you need. You're one with nature. You, you don't get nothing out of the sky. The, the clothes that you're wearing, the, it come from the earth. Everything you have in your household, it comes out of the earth. But you know what? That what you drink, that what you eat, it come out of the earth too. So why would you let somebody else monopolize your food source where you don't do it yourself? Because they got you looking to the sky, right? So when the devil one day decides to lock up his grocery stores, again, I ask you, brother, what you going to eat? Or you just trust him just that much. That, oh, we're going to always make sure we can eat, brother. We got money. We got this. We got that. Brother, that money don't mean nothing. Sister, that money don't mean nothing. You are one pandemic. Oh, I mean, oops, pardon me. You're one pandemic away from that devil closing them grocery stores on you. Now, what you going to do? The religious temples that you run to every week, what do they got saved up for you? Do they have a farm for you? Do they have a farm for you? No, no, no. They got you trapped in that trick bag. They're going to give you spiritual food. But you know what? You are a human. And those four energies and those four forces are real. You must know the science of breathing. The science of drinking. The science of eating and the science of sex. You take one of those four things off the map. You don't live no more. It ain't no more human beings. It ain't no... Spiritual food ain't on there. <laughs> it, it's just not on there. Not for a human being. It's not on there. Breathing, drinking, eating, and sex is what keep you rolling. You are a human being. So, who got your back when the devil closed their grocery stores if you don't have your own back, if you're not doing it for self? This is why, beloved, we must learn urban gardening. We must learn it. We have no choice. We're there now. We we absolutely have, homesteading is our way. We're gonna have to go back to the time of mama them. Even if it's a small chicken coop, or you just ain't got the stomach to kill no animals. If you just grow just a few little things in your backyard, you got to get there. You got to get there. Every single one of us is going to have a small. We got to have a small garden in our at the back of the crib. So much so when you when you look in the homesteading, they got some designs, but beloved, you ain't really got to have the old school like uh, the vertical garden. They got them where they you can build it up. You can have. I mean, pardon me. You ain't got to have a horizontal kind of like set up. You can have the vertical set up where you're building the garden straight up now, because they have different pots and and. and and containers that you can put seed in and you can get it right on that earth and it's a trickle down effect when you water the top when it comes it's a pyramid effect and it blossoms and it's growing real live vegetation because we can watch this devil and he's fixing it where he's trying to keep all the he's hoarding all the seeds 
He's hoarding all the seeds. He's going to sell you seedless plums, seedless watermelons. He already warmed you up. He gave you the seedless grapes first. So if he is, well, what did you get? You don't have any seed to make anything for yourself. But you're on your way to heaven. You, you're on your way to heaven. But your brother is telling you, man, you want pandemic away from them closing them grocery store. Do, do you have a key to Walmart? Do you have a key? Do you have a key to Target? How many of you guys remember when the, when the uh, pandemic first kicked off? How many of you remember that, right? The first thing they closed down was the grocery stores. <laughs> the first thing they got closed. They're like, hey, we got to figure this thing out. And they had local stores that were closed. Then when you they opened them back up, you know what they had? Tape all on the flow. Oh, you got to be from this distance to this distance. Dude, you can't come in here. You ain't got no mask. I remember folks were coming in there and they had no mask. They were turning them around. What, what, what was their option? Well, they, they, they couldn't say, well, I'm going to just go back home. I got a little guard to hold me over. I got a few little... They didn't have shit back at the house. But look at us. We call the man the devil. We don't trust him. We know he's a trickster. We know he's greedy. We learned that from our ancestors. So, much, so many times, man, they come on the podcast and I say, you know, our people, we just imitation niggas. We ain't the original nigga. We're just imitation niggas. And I think, beloved, our people just think I just be talking. But when you go back and you research the indigenous people of this land, when we first came in contact with that European, we called him the Yo Nigga. He was the Yo Nigga. He was the. You look it up if you think I'm making it up. Y O N E G A. He was the Yo Nigga. You, you know what that means, beloved? You know what our people was calling this man? He's a thief and a robber. He's a thief. When he got to these shores, it's just, oh, this guy's a trickster. He's a thief and a robber. And he smells. His hygiene is not necessarily there. He's off. And he's poor. He, bro, he don't have nothing. He's a scavenger. Your red seed brother, right? Your red seed brother used to call him the Wasachu. When he came in, you bet the, the settlers came in. He said, man, the wash at you. You know what that also means? The greedy thief and robber. Everybody around the planet has the same relationship with the same person. In East Africa, they call it the Mazugu. That means the stranger, the wanderer. He's this wicked kind of guy. He's he's so every single indigenous culture and tribe, no matter where you go on the planet, they don't have a good relationship with him. Everybody looks at the guy like he's a greedy thief. He's a robber. You think they're making it up? The sell the settlers had a taking in a thievery society and culture. That was their society, thieving, taking. They were called the men with the big knives because they came up. The Europeans came off the ship with the swords. The men with the big knives. They were ready for war. Check it out. Check it out. Let's go back in history a little bit, right? When Christopher Columbus, when he came to the Americas, he made four expeditions, right? When he came to the Americas, we learned later that, well, that term Americas just means the Western Hemisphere because everything on this side is America. But when you sit in the classroom in Michigan, in Detroit, you think you think that when you the term, oh, he found America, you think, oh, he must have been to Virginia. He must have hit New York or something, or Florida. You learn later he never came to the territory, the, the territory that we call North America or the territory that we call the United States. He never came here. He just went to the islands. You know what I mean? And when he got to the islands, you know, he did something very interesting. He didn't bring slaves. He didn't bring them. He took slaves. And when he took our people back, they made drawings of those in which he took back. And they were dark-skinned people. It wasn't no straight hair. No, 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 the hair's not straight. It was afros. And then when he took a few of our people back, he asked the leadership. We're talking about Christopher Columbus now. He said, if you give me 50 men, I can go take the whole place over, right? Now, while he's down in Santo Domingo, while he's down in Haiti, right? While he's down there in the islands, our people gave him gold. And you would read a history, you'd be like, man, why in the world would they even give him gold? Why did they? Because the indigenous people, our people, were so hospitable, 
we felt like treating the stranger like gods was like going over the type to showing hospitality at another level. And they were so poor, we gave them go. Like, bro, whatever you from, man, hit, hit your man with something or something so he can get back straight because this these devils is poor. But our people had no idea. We had no idea that we was dealing at that time with the original nigga. And then later that term developed amongst our people, the yo nigga, the thief and the fucking robber, the thief and the yo Lakota brother, the Red Sea. He said, oh, the Wasachu, the Wasachu, the greedy thief and robber. Do you think this greedy thief and robber that been like this forever? When it comes to a quote unquote natural disaster or some bad, you know, something's going on, some storm, some pandemic, some war. The devil have so many wars per year. And if something goes wrong and he needs food, you think you first in line? You think you first in line? Do you <laughs> brother, you believe that? You think you're going to pray and some food going to fall out of the sky? Stop the cow. What about your medicine? Look, look at your people. Look at look at what, what about your medicine? You're on his medical list. His pharmaceutical list. You damn near can't even live. You can't even live without it. Now, before he was here, there was no hospitals here. You had a medicine man. You know what the medicine man was? An indigenous person that knew the herbs of the land. Do you know the herbs now? You know how to go to work. You know how to go to work. I mean, they got to set up AI going to take a job in a minute. But right now, you know how to go to work. And he's making them hours longer and longer. Boy, eight hours going to be a thing of the fucking past. It's going to go to 10 and it's going to go to 11. Now you got to work at least 12 hours of the day, brother. Some of us, man, I'm already there. You used to be able to go in that warehouse, right? And those distros and... You know what I'm saying? You used to be able to go there and get your eight-hour shit. You're going to get you about 10 now. He needs you half of the day. Huh? Overworked. Underpaid. Overmedicated. That's black life in America. You missed it. It's okay. I'm your brother. I'll tell you again. Overworked. Underpaid. Overmedicated. That's what black life in America is. And now, Big Mama warned us. She said, don't you ever put your belly in another man's hands, but look at us now. 80% of the groceries are owned by 12 companies. 12 companies. And every time you turn on the, you, you turn on the news, you read another article, it's another billionaire, He's all in the food industry all of a sudden. Bill Gates is in. Buffett is in. You all the the uh your yellow seed brothers and sisters in the east, they all in Africa. Trying to peak the it's all about the land. It, it, it's all about the land. What are you gonna do here? Where's your land? You don't even have a relationship with the farmers in your state. You don't know them. You know where they go get a Chanel bag from. You know where they go get a Cadillac from. You know where they get some herbs from. You telling me about all the new dispensaries that you... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where's the farmers in your state at? Where's the farmers at? Do you know the black farmers in your state? Do you know how many black farmers you have in your state? Boy, our people's in big trouble. <laughs> Brother, we in big trouble. Boy, that processed food got all those carcinogens in it. Ooh, Lord, that boy putting dye in everything. Boy, dye in the Gatorade, the Powerade. You love those sodas? They putting good dye. You know, dye is, is petroleum-based now. You know that, right? That's what make the color. They use petroleum to make the color. You know that ain't safe for human consumption. What you got? We're going to have to take it back to the days of mama them, right? I'm going to leave it there. You got to take it back to the days of mom and them, beloved. Hey, it, it, you ain't got no other way to go. I, I was listening to, uh, check it out. I was listening to uh, 
two religious brothers having a conversation you know what i mean and um one one is like a nephew right brother ben x and it's another brother named jazariak you know what i mean he's like a hebrew is like guy and um uh, man you know those young brothers got so much life you know so much promise there's so much that they can build on because we can all pretty much see the condition of our people you know what i'm saying and these guys and all you know in their their respectful way part of me it's like um they're entrepreneurs right the young nephew brother ben x he's an author he talk a lot about financial literacy right he got a book called of the mindset of the self-employment um and he, it's all about separation of death you know what i mean our brother Cesariak, he makes oils and he got the cherry pop for women and he got some things for men and he got things on his website etc right okay both of these brothers is married and it's all about the next level because we we are already on the family so we got to get to the farming and which get it to the financing and we have to put our kids in the best position so we got to put them in college educate them on, on appropriate health care which is not going down to the devil's uh pharmaceutical market or to his hospitals or eating right eating properly you know what i mean quality neighborhoods they're going back and forth and they're talking about religion and it's just a conversation it's entertainment to me i i always said to myself beloved you can never rope me up in a debate where two original men right black seed men are having a conversation about some desert semitic guy i'm just not interested i think it's silly right but it happens and it's happening more and more it's it's some real mystery guy kind of like conversation kind of like talk right the brother tazariak said something that i thought was very interesting though and he said that the black man and woman of america are in the condition that we are in because our people are living underneath a curse and this is kind of like a divine curse and he got some verses and everything to back it up and i'm like uh <laughs> you know mysticism and mythology and you know you just our people they, they're they're super religious i get it and we take our pride in religion right so much so that it's not about the tribe that we belong to in our immediate family uh we have what we what i call like um it's like an artificial family it's a simulation family and that's the religious family so it's all about value you understand what i'm saying when somebody destroy your physical family you try to replace it with a religious family and your religious family have the most stake in your life this is why niggas take so much pride in being a muslim and being a Hebrew Israelite and being a Christian, it's a bigger badge of honor to be in the family that you're a part of because your natural family has been destroyed. So you lean towards your simulation family. Just you just just listen to niggas. They take like they say like they're a Christian, like that's a key to help them move around in society. Like, huh? They're more Christian than they are their family. Whatever family they belong to, they're more Muslim than their immediate family. They're more Hebrew Israelite than their immediate family. They get this big stake into the simulation family now when this cracker close all these warehouses doors down i can assure you they're not going to be able to knock at the door and use a christian key to get in they're not going to be able to knock at the door and use the jew key to get in or the muslim key to get in it's not going to happen right when that cracker um put that rope around your neck you didn't use a christian key to get that rope from out of your neck when he came into the plantation he didn't say well i'm going to rape a woman but if the one the women are christian i ain't gonna rape them just give me the one that's non-christian he didn't play that he just went in the back and got what that was back there and that key didn't work that muslim key didn't work the christian key didn't work that he is like he sure ain't gonna work it's a little game that we play on ourselves our people are merely dead and i get it in any event though i'm watching the brother they sitting there they talking about some curse right and i think this is so fascinating to me because this is all based on the deal that moses is doing with a deity like four thousand years ago just to think of just think of the mindset this man is saying that the black brown and red seed of america over 60 million of us all of our people is cursed because of a deal that moses did with a deity with a desert god a war god 
four thousand years ago. Okay, okay, okay. My question to that is this: If you did a deal and you didn't fulfill the contract of the deal, so you live in a cursed life, you're at the bottom of every society. Everybody can take advantage of you, plunder you, uh, crap on you because you were disobedient. You didn't listen to the commandments. Priority would be important to me. Right. OK, so if 60 million black people are living on the curse because they didn't follow the laws and statute and commandments of a deity that was a deal was deal with in the desert. My question to that would be, well, when is this Satan character going to be cursed? Like, how does that work? You jumped in ahead of him for the curse? Because you can show me through these passages of these books where human beings were always killed. Their lives were taken for being disobedient, right, to this deity. I get it. So now my question would be, well, the most wickedest person in the book, the epitome of evil is this deity they call Satan. Uh, Shaitan, he's the real character. He's not like he ain't no man. Like we look, he's he's some spook, and he's the most wicked, is evil. He's the chief uh, prince of darkness and all of this. Well, where's his curse in that? How do you, as the Johnny Come Lately human being, the man that comes later, how does your curse come in effect immediately? Where you don't have nothing. You disobedient. You ain't follow the laws, and you at the bottom. Everybody can trade on top of you. But the chief being now that he was he was the first Judas in the whole history of religion, the most wicked. Of the, but you let them tell you now where well, he got principalities and and dominions and high places. He's over kingdoms. He got. So how does that work? How, how does better yet? Let me ask you this. When is the Muslim? When is the Christian? When is a Hebrew Israelite ever going to preach the sermon? about when this God is going to destroy the devil. When is that going to happen? Because we can hear these stories about how you guys people and you disobedient and he going to destroy you. I got that part. You just human. You got 56. What is the lifespan of a human? 50, 60 years? You got 50, 60 years of wickedness. Where's the guy that been wicked from the beginning of the time? Right? When, when is he going to be destroyed? How does all the humans jump in front of him and can meet death but that it doesn't make but see the thing about religion is it, it don't work if he's gone if the satan character is gone it don't work no more see that's that's the hustle they have to keep <laughs> listen to me now this is called God. i'm finna give you some real science they have to keep the satan character this invisible satan character alive because if he goes the jig is up Message. so all the humans can die they can be so evil. You got to build an ark and watch thousands of millions of them away. But that one being that is the prince of darkness and all that, he don't go anywhere. Matter of fact, I go one step further. If you, if you go in the book of Job, right, which uh, poor chop calls Job to make himself fancy. Like Job this, Job this. But we have we have mastery over the English language. We can see the J-O-B means Job. If you look at the relationship with the deity, with the God deity and the, the Satan deity, it looks a little chummy, don't it? It doesn't look like it look like they just some, it's some bubble. It's like some water cooler conversation. Look like it, and they're both strategizing and planning the fate of a man, his family, his wealth, his riches. But he gonna keep his own body. But they was like they working together on that thing, Jack. If I'm, if I'm reading it right, they working together on that thing, Jack. So how does that work? The cursings only go to the humans. The cursings never go to the... Maybe I should leave it alone. <laughs> Beloved, maybe I should leave it alone. Maybe I should leave it alone. We'll leave it there. Because I don't want to get off track. I know how people love some religion. And all I'm asking, all my religious brothers and sisters, all I'm asking is this. When is the devil going to die? I'm talking about the devil you talk about. Because when you come around, many of us will knowledge yourself, we ain't got no devil under the ground. No, no, no. We got, we ain't got him. We ain't got this devil that's, he got all this. No, we, Chad. We talking about Chad. <laughs> 
We talking about Chad and Brad and Billy Joe. But you talking about another devil. You said, nah, that ain't it's some it's some deeper than that. It's something deeper than that, brother. All right. But when is he gonna go? Because the one that we telling you, the physical one, he on his way out. And beloved, before he got to the shores of America, listen, there wasn't no cancer units here. There was no cancer units. The people were naked, brother. He talking about this nigga talking about I let the black and brown and red seed is curse. Nigga, don't you know before the devil got to these shores? He wrote about how much our people had gold. They were peaceable people. It was all family related, organized. No cancer units, no juvenile detentions, no prisons. But look how you live underneath his jurisdiction. See, the real curse is you next to him. Any black, brown, red, or yellow seed in his jurisdiction ain't going to never do well. Listen, the society that's created by wolves ain't going to never benefit the lambs. It's just not going to work because the natures are different. Your nature is not like his nature. That's how come you are like you are because you're taking over. You're taking on his nature. He co-opted your women so he can put his brain in your woman's brain so she can produce children after his wickedness. See, but his time is short. He won't be, he won't even be in this country in 60 more years. He's out of here. He can't even hold Europe. He's out of here. And all of this, this curse thing, just think about it. Beloved, we're taught that heaven is, we can't see it with the natural eye. Not with the religious folks. They, you know, so far away, brother, you can't see it. But we can see the sun. As humans, we can look up, we see the sun. And we see the sun is 93 million miles away. So they say heaven is further past that. You think there's some mystery guy sitting up there past 93 million miles away, worried about the day-to-day -day affairs and making sure you stay on a particular uh, a course of being cursed but he skipped over the, the first Judas the first deity that turned his back that is the chief of wickedness it just doesn't what are we doing here no no you living how you living brother and I'm living how cause it's a it's a made man that's in charge and he is the only wicked one that we know on our earth but he's on his way out and when he makes his exit, this place is going to be a beautiful place, beloved. It's going to be a beautiful place. Peace and black power to your family. Yes. Thank you guys so much for listening and hanging out, beloved. This is indeed Real Black Content from Podcast. Man, that's your brother V. Appreciate you guys for hanging out, man. I'm going to get it with you guys later. Peace, peace, beloved, and more peace. So there's a war on African farmers, a war on African food security and sovereignty that is happening right now across the continent, and we need to talk about it. I just finished watching a documentary about how in Cameroon, the onion farmers there have been completely pushed out of the marketplace because the government has decided to import onions from the Netherlands and other EU countries. If you know anything about African food, you know that onions are a base. They are a staple. Onions, onions also have many other um, medicinal uses. And so these Cameroonian farmers have found themselves in a position where they cannot grow their onions and sell them in the marketplace because these other onions from the EU are much cheaper. In a place like Eastern Congo, the millions of people who have been displaced there, many of them were farmers who have been forcibly removed from their villages so that multinational companies can grab the resources underneath this land. In Kenya, the government has decided that formerly free hold um, land, farmers who formerly um, outrightly owned their land now must be subject to mountains of bureaucracy, now must be subject to the state leasing out this land. Seeds are now being patented by companies like Cargill, by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Poisonous fertilizer is being sold to farmers, and so it is a big mess. In Sudan, the UAE is grabbing up land in the name of carbon credits. This is happening throughout the continent. 
And today on African Liberation Day, where we're celebrating 61 years since the Organization of African Unity was formed, now the AU, we have to wonder, where is this entity? What is it doing? When a transformational leader like um, Ibrahim Traoré says that agriculture, we have to think about our food first because he who feeds you controls you. Africa is home to 60% of arable land, 60% of farmland, the rivers and lakes in this place. There is no way, there is no reason why there should be any type of famine on this continent. And it is something we have to reflect on and we have to think about and we have to keep talking about. Farmers are suffering in Africa. Thanks for listening. Remember to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Google, Anchor, Spotify, and Facebook. Also, don't forget to like, share, and comment on the podcast. Your opinion of what you just heard is important to the platform. So yes, beloved, your comments are the engine and fuel to the machine. Stay blessed and have a powerful day.